Uh, uh, it's, an, it's an honor to be here, but please don't get me hacked. <laughs> I have KGB on my tail. Machines already hate me. <laughs> so I need as many as good human friends I can find in this room. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and I, uh, I can't help teasing uh, American audience, saying that, oh, there's one little piece of trivia from my biography that, in fact, I was born and raised in the deep south right next to Georgia. Actually, it's true. Oh, wait a second. This is. Oh. They just. Okay. Machines hate me, I told you. Yes, they just. Uh, they just messed up. There's not one, one. One slide is missing. But look, it was really deep south of the USSR. In the Republic of Azerbaijan, right next to the Republic of Georgia. Yeah. So, um, and uh, speaking uh, of my homeland, it's just a funny story that my latest book. Uh, deep thinking was about uh, AI, my own experience, uh, fighting, working with, with machines. Um, and uh, uh, the book before, two years ago, uh, was called Winter is Coming. It was not a synopsis of uh, Game of Thrones. <laughs> it was about Vladimir Putin and the enemies of the free world. And while I was on the book tour, everybody wanted to ask me about chess and IBM Deep Blue. Now, when I'm touring uh, with Deep Thinking, everybody wants to ask me about Putin. <laughs> but I'll, I'll try to stick to the topic. I'm sure there will be a couple of questions uh, afterwards, so I will be very happy to answer them. So I'm not a politician. I don't duck questions. <laughs> um, so um, it might seem strange that uh, uh, the game of chess, ancient game, 1500, 2000 years old, God knows, it's, you know, um, um, it's a perfect analogy of artificial intelligence because we talk about, when we talk about AI, we should remember that there's a letter I, intelligence. And what could be better than chess to, to demonstrate that? Um, surprisingly, a lot of people believe that chess is kind of the odd game played by nerds in the dark corner of the cafe. Uh, but to the contrary, when just you look at Hollywood, Hollywood uh, always used it as the shorthand uh, for smarts for their characters. Now look, you know, aliens play chess, X-Men, wizards, I can even mention vampires, not on the picture. Humphrey Bogart, it's an opening uh, stage of, of uh, Casablanca, one of my favorite movies. And for, for the chess geeks, if somebody plays chess here, I can tell you, because I studied this position, I looked inside. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a real you know, opening, it's a French defense that was popular in the early 40s. Humphrey Bogart was a decent chess player. So, um, and uh, I can also mention that Alfred Binet, uh, one of the co-creators of um, IQ test at, at the end of the 19th century. He was fascinated with the chess players' minds, and he studied it for years, again, looking for some you know, shortcuts to, to the secrets of human, human intelligence. Yeah, and uh, it's not surprising that also uh, um, game of chess attracted uh, um, those who wanted to build uh, intelligent machines. But... As usual, the first one, as you can see, it's the, the Turk, von Kempelen's Turk, was a hoax. Um, it, uh, it was a big miracle at the end of the 18th century. It was touring Europe and America. It beat some decent players and also some uh, very uh, famous but weak players like Franklin and Napoleon. But of course it was a hoax. It was not a real playing machine. It was an ingenious system of panels and, and the sliding panels and mirrors and a strong player was hiding inside. Funny thing is that today, more than 200 years later, almost 250 years later, the problem is the opposite. In the tournaments, we have other kind of hoax when the chess players are trying to hide a, a, a device in their pocket. <laughs> so now you have to look for, for, for a computer hiding in a human body. <laughs> Inside. Uh, and the um, uh, Von Kempelen story is famous, but the second one is Torres Sequeda. It's a very little known uh, story about a mechanical device. Mechanical device in 1912 was introduced. It could play only with one piece, but it actually could make uh, make a mate with with, with a rook. Uh, but still, it was you know it was a, you can say the prototype, the first computer. The most you know interesting thing is that um, the founding fathers of computer science, like Alan Turing and Claude Shannon, they were both um, they were they were um, um, 
had great interest for the game of chess, and they believed, they believed that um, um, the game of chess could be, could also, could be um, an opener for this ultimate secrets of human intelligence. And if one day, chess computer plays well against the world champion or beats the world champion, that will be the moment uh, of, you know, of, of revelation. Um, few, few remember that Alan Turing actually wrote the first chess program all the way back in 1952, and it was a great accomplishment, but the most important one, that there was no computer. So it was, it was just an algorithm that uh, he used to play this one game, uh, and uh, he acted like a human CPU. So um, now, it's, uh, it's, it's important to remember that, uh, the, again, these, the founding fathers thought that the way AI will manifest itself is basically following the same path as humans. So it will be kind of the replica, the way we, we work. Uh, to the contrary, contrary to the expectations, actually, it moved in the opposite direction with, uh, uh, with brute force. So um, now, um, I entered uh, the competition against machines in uh, 1985. Um, you could look at this, this picture. It's, the, it's not 10, actually 32 boards. And uh, I played humans, but as, as a matter of fact, the real game was against computers. There are four leading manufacturers of chess computers. At that time, there were some dedicated chess machines. Maybe some of you have them still, like you know, a piece of antique. Um, and they had eight, uh, eight models each, and I played 32. And um, well, I won all 32 games. Uh, but what's very important, it was not a surprise. Everybody thought it was a very, very natural result. And every time I look at this picture and look at these games, uh, I have a sign. That was the golden age <laughs> of chess. Machines were weak, and my hair was strong. Um, 1985, June. 12 years later, I faced just one computer. Just one computer. Uh, by the way, people tend to forget that match in 1997 was a rematch, because I won the first one in 1996 in Philadelphia. Um, and um, okay, I lost this match, but just to be fair, the watershed moment for the computer chess was not in 1997, but I would say in 1996 in Philadelphia. Though I won the match, but I lost game one. Then I fought back, and I won three more games, winning the match four to two. But the fact, the fact that machine was able to be the world chess champion in, in a normal chess game, that was already that's like a big signing on the wall. The rest was a matter of technique, though I didn't expect uh, IBM chess to do so much work and just to come back year later with a stronger machine. But the biggest mistake, except not asking for stock options, <laughs> you know, two weeks of, two weeks of the event and the, uh, it, stayed, it, it rose uh, something like $11.4 billion in value. Okay, but the biggest mistake was not reading the fine print. Because one of the problems in 1996 that I, I faced while playing the blue was, it was a black box. I didn't know anything about the opponent, and while preparing for the game, whether it's a chess game or soccer game or whatever, you always look at the games and, and some strategies used by your opponent. Now, deep blue, no information. Now, I tried to be smart, and I said, for the next match, we have to make sure that um, I will have access to the games played by deep blue. They said, absolutely, but the fine print set played in official competitions. And of course, deep blue has not played a single game outside of the lab. So in 1997, I faced again the, the black box. This is, unfortunately, the role reversed. I won the first game, and I lost, I lost the match. So, um, by the way, where were you hackers 20 years ago when I needed you? <laughs> <laughs> so I think that looking at uh, front rows, some of you maybe might not yet been born. <laughs> um, so, um, um, the problem here, this is, this for me at that match, was that I still treated the match as the great scientific and social experiment. Because I thought that would be great, you know, just to actually check at what point human intuition could be matched or even just overshadowed by the brute force of calculation. And again, Deep Blue, even with this phenomenal speed, 200 million positions per second, pretty good speed for 1997, uh, was anything but intelligent. Um, 
the way the blue played uh, has offered us no input in the mysteries of uh, human of human intelligence. Uh, it was as intelligent as your alarm clock. They were losing to $10 million alarm clock didn't make me feel any better. Um, um, and uh, um, I just realized, I remember opening ceremony of the match when, uh, actually the press conference, when the, 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 um, the man who uh, led the project said, it's the end of scientific experiment, now it's about winning. Okay, that's, that was definitely about winning and losing. So, and I lost to the blue, of course I wanted to play another match, uh, and IBM retired the computer. Um, okay, it's the, I said they killed the only impartial witness. Um, and uh, um, I was actually trying to find out uh, what's happened with Deep Blue, I just I couldn't. But lately, actually, I, I discovered now it uh, has a new career. It's making sushi in JetBlue terminal <laughs> in JFK. <laughs> I, I, I love sushi, but I don't eat there. Yeah, guys. <laughs> Some, I don't know why. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Again, that's just the, that the story was over for chess, and that's very quickly because, again, as I'm sure some of you playing chess, it's, whether it's chess, we talk about Go, about other games, humans are vulnerable because we don't have steady hand. We make mistakes. So even the great game played by the world leading players at the very top uh, world championship match, say 50 moves, 45 good moves, four great moves, one tiny inaccuracy is inevitable. We, in the human game, it doesn't matter. In the fighting machine, you'll be punished. Not losing, maybe, maybe not losing the game, but definitely not winning, so machine will escape. So uh, I just realized at one point that it just will be a matter of time, because we cannot reach the same level of vigilance and precision that is required to beat the machine, because machine has a steady hand. Again, we saw the same in Go many uh, uh, years later, actually. Lately, machine uh, conquered the game of Go as well. Uh, but again, it was just about the game of chess. And uh, it's the game proved to be vulnerable to the brute force. Um, but it's, you know, it was not, uh, it was not uh, um, yet um, an AI as is being trumpeted by IBM and by, still people remember the match saying, oh, it was the dawn of AI. Actually not. Um, and later on, uh, I played a few more matches with the machines. Because uh, we, when these days I analyzed these games using the modern chess engines, you know, it was quite a painful experience, traveling back to the past, revisiting it, and recognizing how poor yeah, I played in this match. I have to blame myself. But also that Deep Blue was not strong enough. This is something that you may not believe, but a free chess app on your mobile device today is stronger than Deep Blue. Yes, trust me. Yeah, and of course if you have a, a, a chess engine like you know, Stockfish or Commodore and you have it on your laptop, it's much, much stronger. And uh, I just, you know, run these games, and it's one of the moments, I think game five, just looking at the end game, and the Deep Blue saved the game by miracle, and everybody talked about the great escape and phenomenal quality of chess. Today, you put it in the computer, it, it, it's, it laughs. It shows within 30 seconds to a minute, depending on the strength of your, of, of your, um, or the speed of your laptop, is that First, it was a draw, Deep Blue made a mistake, then I made a mistake, missing win, and then Deep Blue saved the game. So, that's okay. That's, the, that's, that's a Moore's law, I guess. And it's, there's nothing wrong about it. Um, and uh, uh, those the two more matches I played in 2003, they both matched ending in draw. Uh, I played, actually, I, they forced me to wear the glasses to play on X3D, as if playing machine was not, you know, tough enough. Yeah, I, uh, I just did, I did well, so I was quite pleased with, with, uh, with um, my accomplishment. But again, the story was over, so I knew it, and um, I just was thinking in the future. And just, um, just what gave me a good thought, just look at this picture. This is the kids, so you have the 90s, you have the, the beginning of the century, this century, and then modern days. So kids, you know, they just, um, they have to look at the... Uh, it's like a piece of antique. My kids will not recognize it. So then this is more sophisticated uh, um, uh, keyboards, and now they just, they're sliding their fingers. So um, what is important that is, it's, it, more intelligent machines make our task easier again. I'm 
I'm telling you that so you know better than anyone else. So unleashing our human creativity by clearing away the repetitive and technical tasks. So then I had a thought. Um, how about combining the strengths of machine and humans? And let's use chess as the um, as um, uh, as an example, because in chess you have the result. You know exactly where machine is strong, and you know exactly what machine cannot do as well as humans. So I came up with with a concept um, that I called advanced chess. Okay, following the famous Russian say, you can't beat them, join them. Uh, so I call this advanced chess. Man plus machine facing another human plus machine. So, um, and in 1998, I played another elite player, Veselin Topala from Bulgaria. You can see this picture uh, with both heads again, pieces of antique. Uh, now, the interesting thing is that we did not do well because we were not, we were not able to maximize the effect of work with the computer. And I just couldn't understand why. We're great players. So what's wrong with that? So why we didn't do well? And then, again, the answer came later with the intro introduction of the so-called uh, freestyle chess tournament on internet, what I call invitation for cheating. You can play on internet, uh, being connected to the supercomputer, you can have your own computer, you can have many computers, I mean, do whatever you want. Now, as predicted, human plus machine always dominated supercomputer. Again, the reason is very simple, because machine compensates for our weaknesses. So we get, if we get to a good position, then you can switch to the computer. So no more vulnerabilities of, of, uh, of humans that can be exploited by the other machine. But the trick was not this, that's, it, it, that, that was not a sensational result. The sensational result was that the winners of the competition, the first one, and as was repeated later, were not top players, but actually relatively weak players, uh, working with ordinary machines, but having superior process. And that led me to, to make this uh, formulation, which I think is quite important because it's, it's hard to understand and it sounds like a paradox, that a weak player plus a, an ordinary machine plus a superior process will be dominant in the game against a strong player, even strong computer, an inferior process. Interface decides everything. And uh, it's, uh, it's quite amazing that it's just, uh, you, you don't need a strong player. You don't need Gary Kasparov just to be at the, at, at, at the side of the machine, finding the best moves. And the answer is simple. Because when you look at the relative strengths of humans and machines today, and I will go beyond chess, but let's start with chess because in chess we have numbers. If you are aware with, with, the, with the ratings and the rankings in chess well, just to give you an idea, uh, when on, uh, my, my top rating was 2851. When I retired, was, I dropped, I was 2812. Magnus Carlsen is traversing the 2800 territory as well. There are about 50 players or plus in 2700, early 2800 category. That's, 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 that's an elite of the world of chess. Now, today is the strength of the computer. It's about 3200. Now, and on dedicated software, it will be 33 to 3400. Now we understand why you don't need a strong player because strong player like myself will be tempted to push the machine in this direction or that direction. I will be challenging machines' uh, evaluations, while to the contrary, I have to be an operator. So a decent player that doesn't have the same pride, the same honor as the world champion or a strong player, will be far more effective in creating the human machine, human machine combination. I think this is, this is it's, it's a very important discovery in chess, and I believe it goes beyond chess. For instance, in medicine, we know today that uh, uh, in, in many cases, machines are far more accurate in giving diagnosis than the best doctors. So would you, would you like a good doctor to work with a machine or a good nurse that will just follow instructions, will do a little guidance, but not will interfere? Because if, I don't know the exact numbers, but say the doctor will be good in 60, 65% of cases, machine in 85%. Numbers are on the other side, but psychologically, if you are a good doctor, you cannot accept it. So, when we look at the, at the progress of computers these days, it's just basically we should realize that machines can, whether it's online translation, medical diagnosis, you name it, could be good at climbing at 80, 85, maybe 90%. But now, that's, that's, that's where we belong to, humans. The last decimal places. 
And it could make a hell of a difference. It's like, you know, when we shoot a bullet, just, you know, one degree difference in the angle, and it could, you know, be 100 meters uh, uh, gap, you know, on the, wide on the target. So the same is here. It's, it's, it's about our ability to actually channel this massive computing power and just to find the right, right direction for that. So, and, um, so I still believe that with all the fears that machines are just going to replace us and just, you know, it will be the end of the world, another Armageddon, I believe there's room. There's plenty of room. Because as I said, it's about human creativity. And these unique tools, intelligent machines, will enhance our creativity, unleash our creativity if we know how to use it. Um, so uh, one of the, actually looking for the answers, sometimes you go off, off site, not, in the, uh, not searching in the world of science, uh, but in the world of art. And uh, I found quite, quite a good paradox that was uh, um, um, allegedly said by, by a great artist. Computers are useless, they can only give us answers. I think that's, it's, it's, it's a piece of wisdom. Again, you don't expect you know, Picasso to be on the side of philosophy, but I find it, I find it quite, uh, quite uh, um, encouraging. Because machines find answers, and answers and an end. And Picasso could not accept ends, he was an artist. It's, uh, he, he, he had constantly reinvent, he had to reinvent constantly his art. That's what we do. So this is exactly where we, where we have to start, asking questions. Um, can machine ask questions? Uh, once I, I uh, paid a visit to the Bridgewater, this is the largest hedge farm, the reason I wanted to talk to Dave Ferrucci, the, fa the founder of Watson. And we talked about machines asking questions. And uh, we had a little debate, and he said, yes, machines can ask questions, but they don't know what questions are relevant. Thank you. So that's exactly the point. So we are, we are still, you know, still in the game. We're still in the game. We still have a chance to move on. And uh, again, that gives me a lot of, a, a lot of confidence that uh, the, game, the game is not over. And uh, um, just a few pictures. So I, um, um, some photos from the future of autonomous machines and machines that you know, essentially program themselves. So the one picture there is Demis Hassabis and his AlphaGo. Actually, this is a probably the first machine that, uh, that could be called uh, a prototype of AI. As I said, deep blue, brute force. Watson, still, it's, it's maybe it's a tr transition, but it's not AI. Now, AlphaGo, is, it's, it's a deep learning program that keeps um, reinventing itself by looking for the patterns while playing millions and millions of games. Now, I can tell you that's the first time that we are dealing with, with real black box. Because with Deep Blue, for instance, if you had um, 100 years to spare and, uh, and you would be willing to look for thousands of miles of, of, uh, of logs, you'll definitely go back to the original idea, why this decision was made. Now, with AlphaGo, I don't believe that even Demis Hassabis can tell you why version 6 plays better than version 9 or other way around. So it's a, it's a great accomplishment on one side, but on the other side, it, uh, it might be challenging because if there's, the, if there's a bug, so how are we going to find it out? But again, that's, moves, that, 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 that's a move in, in, in this AI, is AI direction. Um, and while I just, you know, I was, I, I was, um, I spoke at um, uh, Google's HQ at uh, um, Mountain View, um, uh, and uh, they gave me a tour of uh, Google X, this is an interesting observation, because obviously there are many challenges for self-driving cars and uh, for other projects, for, for the drones, flying drones, dropping goods. But the biggest problem actually comes not from, a, I'm, maybe I'm wrong, another problem, probably as big as a technical one, comes from regulations. And this is an interesting question. People say, oh, machines are just you know, killing jobs, you know, they're replacing uh, humans, so what are we going to do? That's called history of civilization. That, that, that has been happening over millennia, hundreds of years. I think, to the contrary, the problem is not that machines are replacing, replacing human jobs now on, on the intelligent, intellectual side. As I said, now machines are going after people with college degrees and Twitter accounts. 
Not too fast. I think too slow. And let me tell you why. Because it's a normal cycle. We just don't recognize that uh, disruption means that the new technology, breakthrough technology, before it creates jobs, it kills jobs. It, 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 it renders whole industries redundant, obsolete. And then it creates new jobs. This is a process. This is a cycle. Now, if you try to protract the agony by sticking with the old technologies by whatever, printing money or just creating some artificial advantages for the old industries, you make this process slower and more painful. It's going to happen anyway. But the problem is that with so many regulations, we're just facing that many things are just, just being intentionally slowed down. Uh, and um, I believe this is, this is it's, it's an even a bigger problem than, than the challenges we're facing. And it's psychologically, people say, oh, how can we sit in the driver's car? Really? I just looked, you know, back and this is, found that 100 years ago, one of the most powerful unions in New York City was the union of elevator operators. <laughs> really? 17,000 strong. You know, it's just because people, by the way, technology to push the button was there already. But people didn't trust it. You know, how can you get in the elevator and just to push the button? <laughs> ah. You know, what's, you know, you, you know why, why this union died and why, why people switched on? Because one day they decided to go on strike. <laughs> you know, strike. And when people had to climb to the Empire State Building, they decided maybe the, you know, you'd rather push the button. <laughs> and I'm thinking now, just you know, 20, 30 years from now, that our kids, our grandchildren, they say, are these crazy guys, they were driving cars? Look at the statistics. This is one of the greatest causes of human death. How could they afford to do that? <laughs> uh, and of course, you know, this is, it's, it's pure psychology. So, so many accidents we know, people being killed in car accidents. But if you have one accident in a driver's car, that's a big story. Any, any glitch, any mistake, you know, made with AI, with new technology, that's a story, you know, front page of newspaper. But again, statistically, come on, just, you know, simply, you know, just look at numbers. Yes, I understand it's bad if you are in this, you know, in this tiny percentage. But as the, as the humanity, we'll all win if we just move forward, you know, just without uh, being paralyzed by, by, this, by this fear. Um, so, um, and um, it's, a, it's a picture of the it's a vast security center. And, uh, um, you know, um, another question is now, because we talk about fake news and we talk about cybersecurity, it's, 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 it's a big political issue. And uh, there are many calls. So how, how are we going to fight hate speech, for instance? So I do regular blogs for Avas. My new one that will be released in a couple of days is it's about hate speech. As I say, it's the fighting hate, saving speech. Because we just we should realize that this problem did exist before. It's not that they're being invented. They're being magnified. Because the internet just involves millions and actually billions of people. In Again, I think it's good news. And just we should simply realize that it's Trying to stop it, trying to outlaw it, you know, it's not going to work because you will still have Putins of this world, you will have other, you know, bad guys sitting elsewhere that they will use our own technology created in, in the free world against us. So I think we should just embrace it. That's my view. So I always say it's, it's about us. The answer is inside us. It's about our own strengths uh, and our, our own confidence. And I say that intelligent machines will not make us obsolete. Our complacency might. So um, uh, I think that it's just, you know, we, we should just realize that, again, there's certain limitations in these corporations of human and machines, but there's plenty of room. Just plenty of room as it happened before. It opens new opportunities. It destroys the old world and it creates a new one. And sooner we move forward, better we are. Now it's just, now let's move to more of just, uh, so, uh, it's a science fiction world. It's an, it's an interesting paradox that when you go back 50, 60 years, the science fiction was all positive. It was all utopian. And then gradually it moved from utopian to dystopian view. You know, it's just, we don't want to hear about this future. By the way, it didn't happen just overnight. It was a time when people decided maybe it's too, uh, it's too risky to, uh, 
to uh, do the space exploration. Actually, well, it is too risky. But just imagine that in 1969, 1969, when Americans landed on the moon, the entire computing power of NASA was less than a, 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 the a computing power of any device in your pocket here. So this device is a thousand times more powerful than Cray's supercomputer 40 years ago. So just imagine for a moment how much power we carry with us and how we use this. I'm not sure that, this, that Apple uh, iPhone 7 is the same as Apollo 7. This has the same effect. And I think there's many great things that can happen if we start looking for, you know, just for the, sky, for, for the stars again, deep oceans. There's so many great things we can do. And again, we should realize that machines, they're offering us an opportunity to take larger risk. And um, just I wanted to, uh, to end up on, on a positive note. Is it positive? <laughs> Actually, it is. No, by the way, the, the picture in the bottom, yes, it's, it's, not, it's not a Photoshop. It's a real one. Yes, I was in the office of the Terminator in 2003. Yeah. Oh, he, but he loved the game of chess. His kids, you know, had this kind of mandatory lessons. Yeah, we played the game of chess. Uh, I guess ended in the draw very quickly. <laughs> and he was, I'm, I'm sure he was so excited that six months later he ran for the governor of California. <laughs> and won. <laughs> uh, now, you think, why the picture is there? Why it's, why it's, uh, um, why I call it positive? Because, you know, set aside the first movie, in the rest uh, of the, of the seri series, uh, it's, it's not just, you know, Arnold, who always, is always on a winning side, you know, old but not obsolete, uh, beating um, uh, newer machines, but actually it's a combination of what I described a few minutes earlier. It's a uh, human plus an old machine plus a superior interface dominating newest machines. <laughs> so I guess I, it gives us a little bit of, you know, just of, of confidence that working with machines and having the best interface, and I'm sure, you know, you guys are just the best in the world who can do that, so this is how we move forward. And, uh, and then for those who say yes, but machines will eventually get everything done. So this is no matter what, you know, they'll, they'll calculate everything because machines know the odds. They will calculate. Oh. It's not about calculating everything. By the way, the game of chess, for instance, is technically you could call mathematically infinite, 10 power 45, number of legal moves. That's more than enough for any computer in the universe. Uh, but the most important thing is this, again, is this, in the games, it's all, you know, just it it's, can be not calculated, but machine can be always ahead of humans. It's all about playing by the rules. And you know the rules are fixed. You know that machine can, you know, just uh, find the best, best path in, 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 in these jungles. But now if we move into the, if we move into the just normal situation in our lives, are you sure that machines can, can be helpful all the time? Let's look at a very simple, ordinary situation, mundane. You have your computer running your budget. And you are in the store. You're buying a gift. An expensive gift. And machine beeps, ah, you're off the limit. Machine knows the odds. But just one more, one slight change. You have your kid next to you and it's his birthday or her birthday. Now, how does it change the equation? It changes everything. It could be a wedding gift or whatever. I can start adding these little things that will change everything and I don't think you can simply, you know, incorporate it into, into this equation. So definitely, we have, you know, we have, we have a lot of room. It's like asking the question. It's, and because the situation changes. And this is, this is something that you may call ordinary, but I had something that's following the movies, I have something more dramatic. Let's look for something that is uh, extraordinary. <laughs> Empire Strikes Back. Uh, you remember this, this, this little episode? The yeah, Han Solo is, 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 is uh, directing the ship into the field of asteroids, and the C3, C3PO is just a uh, panic. The chances of surviving in this field are 3,720 to 1. Never tell me the odds. Now, this is interesting. It's just, uh, just let's go from the humorous part to the real one. Who was right? Technically, C-3PO was right. The chances of surviving were slim to none. And 
Maybe technically, being caught by Imperial Guard was a better option, was it? Because humans could re recognize that even if technically for the computer, in the computer eyes, the chance of being caught by, by Imperial Guard, it's offered the better, or better odds, that was not an option at all. So this is very important that in many cases, again, both simple, ordinary, and extraordinary, uh, uh, highly unusual, so we still have room. We still have room to move on and just to, to make all the difference. Um, I'm saying that human leadership is still required. And sometimes, sometimes, it, that will mean go, going against uh, the computer recommendations. So the essence of human leadership is not a question of knowing the odds, but a question of knowing what really matters. Not just today or tomorrow, but for the distant future. Call it human guidance. Or you may even call it human interference. Interference with our intelligent machines. And I believe that will set the course for this century. Now, it, sometimes it surprises people that uh, I'm such an optimist uh, after, about intelligent machines, uh, considering my personal experience. But I am, I'm an optimist. It's uncured optimist by nature, I have to say. And I believe that you all, too, are optimists about the future of humans and intelligent machines. Because what we should remember, our technology is agnostic. It's neither good nor bad, and it could be used for good or evil. The machines will keep getting smarter and more capable. And it's up to we humans to do what only humans can do. Dream. And dream big. So we can get the most out of these amazing new tools. Thank you. I, 10 minutes, yes, exactly as planned, yes, so. I'm still Hi. A, a, a decent player, yes, manage some time. Hi. Here, here. Can here. I ask a question now? Yeah. Here, I have one. Um, so I, re I recently saw a Reddit post about a composition that the stockfish couldn't solve. Sorry, uh, is it possible? Uh, to create a machine learning system that detects where, uh, what problems are more likely to be solved for a human than any computer? Do you hear the question? It's the, the sound is somehow, I don't know why, but the sound is just, uh, it's quite... Uh, in your left. I'm in mean your yes. left. <laughs> it's just, again, it's just where, it's just that's at the DEF CON conference and the... The guy asking a question. Yes, right okay, here. yes. Here, here. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, I can hear you, yes, okay. All right, so as I saw a composition that couldn't be solved so for stockfish. So Yes, I mentioned stockfish, but there are many other problems. It, it's possible to create a machine learning classifier that uh, detects what kind of opposition is easier to play for human or more likely to be played better for a human? Um, look, it's the, it's the, first of all, you, we don't expect a you know, machine to make a first move and to announce a mate in 17,555 moves. So, uh, and um, I think definitely we can, you know, we can use machines just for, um, for the best recommendations for specific styles. And that's, by the way, what the top players are doing. They're always looking for machines as the, sort of, as the, as the, um, as the guides to, um, to help them to get to the positions that they like most. So, um, because again, you have to just recognize that uh, machine evaluation is in nine out of 10 cases is, is far superior to, to, to the humans. All right, thanks. Hello, uh, would you agree that real, hi. Yeah. Uh, would you agree that real intelligence requires free will and free choices that only humans can make and Deep Blue and any computer program is actually written by people. And when you lose to Deep Blue, you don't lose to a machine. You lose to a programmer, programmers of those programs. Oh. So my question is, do you think we are in any danger of any kind of intelligence 
until computer can have free will. Uh, it's a, you know, we're moving now from the uh, scientific domain to, to, to philosophy. Uh, uh, as for Deep Blue, it's very clear. It was a product of, of, of a great work by, by humans. And I, you know, uh, in, in most of the cases, we're dealing even with AlphaGo and with Demis Hassab's team. It's still the result of the work of, of uh, um, uh, human intelligence. Now, um, whether machines could have a free will or not, I don't know. Um, I used to, I, I, I used to believe that anything that we do, while knowing how we do that, machines will do better. But there are many things that we do without knowing how we do that, without even re recognizing why it's happening. And I don't think it will be easy for machines, if possible at all, to grasp it. So, for instance, we have purpose, but we don't know what purpose is. So that's why I think it's this, if you're talking about free will, which is somehow connected to the purpose. So I think it's, uh, it might be very, very distant future for machines to, uh, to get on close to that. Thanks. Over here. Yep. Uh, what are your thoughts on human characteristics such as bravery and morality and the decisions that artificial intelligence can make related to that? For example, the vehicle choosing to hit a child or go off a cliff and he'll kill a driver. Uh, that's exactly the sense that states. You may call it passion because it's the, the all different, you know, um, human characteristics that cannot be quantified, at least easily quantified. And that's, the, that's why I use the Han Solo example because at the end of the day, when, you saw, when we're talking about bravery, it's, it's very often going against the odds. So I think this machines, by definition, will not be able to grasp it since, since they are basic, they, 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 they based on, on, on sort of the best, the finding the best patterns and sort of the best evaluations. And uh, being brave and being passionate very often, in most of the cases, goes against uh, the uh, precise calculation. Mr. Kasparov, I have a question a computer would not consider important. Uh, what's in your flask and may I try some? <laughs> What is contained in your flask? I actually have the stoli that you pulled out of your pocket. I think that's what he wants to know. My pocket? Stolichne. <laughs> it's not an advertising. You saw, you know, I just dropped it. <laughs> Who will be the next human world champion? And do you think the young Chinese player Wei Yi has a chance to dethrone Carlson? Um, currently, Magnus Carlsen is, this, is the number one player, just not a world champion, he's still the dominant player. Uh, he, is 20, he will be turning 27 this year, so he's still quite young, though but not very young by the modern standards. I think VE is 18 or 19. So um, I think Magnus will be facing younger players. There are two younger Americans, like uh, Wesley Son, Fabiana Caruana. Uh, and the way he definitely, you know, by definition, makes a potential challenger. There we can. It's uh, to be the world champion. It requires more than talent and being young and energetic. Uh, uh, you know, you need probably an element of luck. But they definitely is in the category of those who can and most likely will challenge Magnus Carlsen. Thank you. You discussed primarily deterministic algorithms or even basic machine learning when you were talking about using machines as tools to supplement our intelligence. However, uh, what do you say to the immense amounts of resources being poured into creating a strong AI or even uh, putting a human brain into a computer? Yeah, but um, again, I always have to confess, you know, my ignorance, and sometimes I just, I'm not sure I'm in a position to answer the question, but something that always, you know, was, it's just, um, I was always struggling to understand whether human brains, let's imagine you can just separate it from our body, whether it can function separately. Because I don't know, and this is probably, you, you guys know better, so how the brain's functioning outside of the body, whether the, 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 the fact is that it's moving, so it's connected to our body, makes it makes it work the way it works. Maybe not. We don't, but again, yeah, this is a kind of an experiment that definitely we'll see maybe again in, 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 in the future. But my view is that it's the, it's the, the, the combination of the movements and, and other hu human factors and emotions create um, the mind that is just, it's bigger than just simply, you know, taking the brain and freezing it and using it as the, as the uh, 
um, device full of neurons. Thank you. Yep. Hi. Sorry. Hi. Um, I was wondering, uh, in light of the trend of machines eliminating human jobs, what are your thoughts on the idea of universal basic income? Yeah, just this again is the... Sorry, okay. Uh, what are your thoughts on the idea of machines, uh, sorry, of universal basic income? Um, no, it's the, uh, thank you, it's, it's a very important question because clearly we are moving at, it's, it's moving, uh, uh, reaching the point where a lot of people will be just left behind. Since um, it's, the, the, it's, it's kind of a paradox of, of, uh, um, of the technological progress. On one side, we have great new technologies uh, that make, that, that, that gives huge competitive advantage to younger people. Just, you know, every new generation is far more sophisticated uh, just by dealing with this, with, with these devices. On the other side, we have a progress in medicine and a diet that, uh, that helps people to live longer and just to, to keep their, just, you know, ability to work for, for many, for longer years. So, but obviously my generation at 50s and of course 60s and even in 40s, it's just, it can, can, can hardly be competitive with, with the young kids just moving in. So uh, we have to look for this, um, for this uh, paradox and for, for this growing gap. Because we just have a gap that, that from history we know always led to big explosions. A gap between the social infrastructure of the society and the technological uh, uh, pr progress. And uh, what you said is just probably it's a part of, the, part of the solution, but the problem is that the politicians they are just trying to dump it, you know, just to, 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 the next, to, the, to the next elections. Nobody wants to talk about it because it's painful. Because it basically challenges the very foundation of the, of the sort of modern world order. It's much easier to do quantitative easing, you know, and keep printing money. So thinking that somebody else will pay. So there's many, many paradoxes that, that make me feel uneasy. Because for instance, the piling debt will, will have to be paid by younger, younger, younger people. But Will they be willing to do it and keeping the social guarantees for the old generation that made this debt? I think we are just, you know, it's, no, it's, again, I, 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 there are more questions that I, I can ask than, 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 than answers that I can produce. Hopefully AI can help us with that. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's very troubling that the political class uh, in the free world for, for, for years, if not for decades, is trying to, to, to ignore the problems that we are just discussing now. Because these problems will, they're already manifesting. They're already on display. And just, you know, ignoring the fact is that, you know, as we have this, this the technological progress, the, the huge development of, in many areas, is inevitably changing our lives. It's, it's extremely counterproductive and, and it's basically neglecting our future. Thank you. That is all the time we have for questions. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you, Mr. Kasparov.